I played many video games this year. I used to write about almost every single one on the blog, then I decided to let go of reviews because they didn't feel all that entertaining to write, and I wanted to focus on something truly analytical and narrow and glorious. This year I had the pacing problems of Amori because that game bugged me for weeks, and the narrative splendor of Rusty Lake that took me like three months to conceive and write. And I think those two turned out great, and I would love to make more content like this telling people about good games or not-so-good games and how they tell their stories. I know that Sekiro and Soulsborne and translations are a bigger part of the blog and the channel as of now, but it won't always be this way. The world of Sekiro is a project, and it will be completed at some point. I don't really want Shatani's Lair to be a single game or a single thing blog. It's my lair, and it will have various things I enjoy and things I enjoy talking about. Video games. I've played about 40 games this year, and it would take me an hour to briefly tell you about each one, so I chose to highlight only those that I liked, or disliked, the most. I came up with a few silly categories, so I hope you'll be entertained. It just so happened that this year I played probably the best game of my entire life, and I also played probably the worst game of my entire life. It's been an interesting year. Some little notes before we get started. The games I will list in this video are the games I completed this year. There will be one that I refunded and one that I abandoned after a few hours, but the rest of them are completed. These games were not necessarily released in 2021. My backlog is huge, there are titles that just released, there are classic titles from 15 years ago that I miss but want to play. It's a mixed pot of whatever video games I decided to play for whatever reasons. I don't think I'll spoil anything major about any game in this video, but just to be safe, check the timestamps, and if you don't want to know anything about one game or another because you intend to play it yourself, just skip the section. And the most important thing, get ready for unpopular weird opinions, criticism, even weirder games praise, you played 10 years games ago, you've never heard and about, personal opinion. Everything in this video is my personal opinion. If you hate the game I liked or love the game I didn't like, it's fine. We're all different, our opinions are shaped based on our previous experiences, not necessarily with video games, but with life in general. I'll be happy if you find something on my list that piques your interest. This video is basically for me to share many games I enjoyed with other people, so they might enjoy them too. I wanted to start with the best games I played and then move to the worst, but I don't want to finish the video on a grim note, so we'll start with a few of the games that I didn't like this year and then move on to the amazing stuff. I had my hopes really, really high when 12 Minutes was announced, and I was really excited to play it. However, this game ended up being one of the biggest disappointments I experienced this year. The writing didn't impress me, to say the least, it's probably one of the worst examples I've ever seen. The dialogues are so bad, I couldn't believe they tried to trick me into thinking that the two protagonists had been happily married for 8 years or however long it was. They could very well be complete strangers. I found the time loops themselves to be tedious and boring. If you have ever seen a movie, read a book, or played a game that centered around time travel and time loops, the whole plot will become clear to you in the first hour or so. The story's cliché doesn't bring anything new to the theme. What a waste of such a brilliant cast. They had Willem Dafoe in it. This is the only game I actually refunded this year, and I hardly ever do that. This is the second worst game I played this year. Ender Lilies is supposed to be Metroidvania, and yet it just doesn't work like one, because its map is absolutely horrendous. It's impossible to see where you are precisely. A room with multiple levels is pictured as one rectangle, which makes navigation and backtracking painful. For example, in Bloodstained the map is similar, but if you jump up and get to another screen, it's a different rectangle on the map, not the same one. The game is full of passages you cannot access because you lack some sort of ability, which is fine. However, it doesn't have map pins for you to mark the passage so you'd know that this one requires dash and this one seems to be blocked by underwater breathing and whatnot. It is supposed to be a metroidvania, and yet every single metroidvania aspect in this game is designed to irritate the living hell out of you. I would have refunded it, but for some reason I decided that it would be fun to stream it, and it wasn't, and now I'm kind of stuck with it. I am kind of known for heavily disliking Divinity Original Sin 2. For a couple of years, it had been the worst game I played. I played all of it, wasted 108 hours on it. You can read all about that in my lengthy blog post full of typos that I'm intentionally not fixing. 
The worst thing about Divinity Original Sin 2 was that at any given moment it was either awesome or horrible and there was no middle ground. However, this year I played something so bad that it makes Divinity Original Sin 2 look great. I never wrote a blog post about this game, I never tweeted about my experience, partly because people would most certainly ravage me and partly because I thought that this game did not deserve any more of my time. Not a blog post, not even a tweet. And it's near Automata. I hate it so freaking much. It's a mediocre slasher at best. Its open world is basically a festival of invisible walls and big empty spaces. Neither setting nor story make any sense. Any sense. The game is trying to hypnotize you with 2B's butt cheeks flapping in the middle of the screen non-stop so you wouldn't question what's actually happening. I have so many questions that didn't get answered and now just kind of hang in there. It's frustrating beyond belief. The game just throws around random facts, never bothering to connect them, never bothering to explain how things actually work, so all the plot twists just come out of nowhere. And yeah, the androids are as emotional as humans, although they're kind of not supposed to be. They cry, strangle one another as if they're not just Terminators who look like teenagers. The game doesn't bother being consistent with its setting and with its own claims, it's just whatever. Oh, and the game hates you. You will be replaying the same stuff again and again and again from scratch until the game kindly decides you've had enough. There were a few things that kept me playing. I wanted to see what all the fuss was about. My friend kept telling me that the game will get better. We're not friends anymore. Music was great in some areas, and um, Natsuki Hanai's voice guided me through this misery like a morning star. I reached the true ending, but I couldn't be bothered to hop the last hurdle, and I watched the final cutscene on YouTube. That's how much respect I have for this game. Nier Automata made me the happiest person on the planet when I realized I never have to launch it again. I'd rather play the entirety of Divinity Original Sin 2 again and sink a hundred more hours into it then play five more minutes of this. Moving on to the games that I actually enjoyed this year. Tyranny was something I always wanted to play, but somehow just kept putting it off. CRPG is my single most favorite video game genre. I adored Obsidian's previous project, Pillars of Eternity, so it was just a matter of time before I had the right mood for Tyranny. I know it has mixed reviews, and it undoubtedly has its highs and lows, but I really, really enjoyed it. The premise of you already serving evil in the world where evil has won was refreshing because I usually try to be the good guy when given the choice. I really fell in love with many characters that I met throughout my adventures. I thought that the voice acting was incredible. The world building was very thorough despite the fact that tyranny is much shorter than you would expect a modern CRPG to be. There were so many paths I could take, so many ways to wage war with different factions or to have peace with them or to just step aside and forge my own path. I felt like the story was something that I could truly control and the world would just bend to my decisions. Well, this was the most anticipated game of the year. It's a little puzzle game where you need to organize a bunch of different dogs so they all fit the grid. I enjoyed it a lot, just as much as I enjoyed Cats Organized Neatly last year. This is a great game to play on your own if you're into these kind of puzzles, or you can always engage your kids or younger relatives. Works great for the whole family. And check out Cats Organized Neatly. It has a paper version that you can actually print out. I hope this one will get its paper version too. I keep pronouncing it Dwarf Romantic. This is my go-to game when I just want to relax and unwind and listen to music or a podcast. I stream it sometimes when I don't have the mental capacity for action games and just want to talk to my community and have a great time. I really like that Dwarf has little objectives you need to complete by organizing your tiles in a specific way, build a long railroad, a big city, or a large forest. I have troubles playing Townscaper because it doesn't have any objectives and it's just a blank canvas that requires too much creative effort for me. Dorf is amazing, however bad I am at organizing my tiles, littering the map with disconnected fields or putting a railroad and a river close together, these little worlds look beautiful nonetheless. Assemble with Care is a short game that combines a visual novel and a very tactile puzzle where you need to fix various antique items. I enjoyed it a lot, the story is short yet heartwarming and bittersweet. 
I absolutely loved the tinkering part where I had to enthusiastically draw circles with my mouse to unscrew screws or use it as a paintbrush to smear glue around. The items you fix are real-life antiques, so if you're into old treasures, you'll like it. I strongly recommend Assemble with Care, it's a great game to brighten up your evening. This game was certainly a rare find, I hadn't heard about it at all until Steam somehow shoved it into my recommendations. Unforeseen Incidents turned out to be an awesome point-and-click adventure game. The story is quite engaging, it's about an epidemic of an unknown, highly contagious disease. Hits kinda differently in 2021. The writing is witty, and the voice acting is great. It reminded me of young adult detective novels that I used to read by dozens when I was younger. Unforeseen Incidents is also very stylish, could very well become a graphic novel that I would read with great pleasure. As far as I know, the devs are now working on a new project. Looking forward to it. Resty Lake was one of the biggest discoveries I made this year. I absolutely adored this series, and I have both a video and a blog post all about it, so you can check those out. I love all games from the Resty Lake series equally. However, if I had to pick one that I love slightly, just slightly less, it would be Resty Lake Paradise just because I thought some puzzles were repetitive and had more levels than necessary. I think Rusty Lake is a treasure, and more people should play it. Can't wait for the past within. Papatura is a sweet, sweet point-and-click adventure game that I followed closely ever since I played its very short demo during one of the Steam festivals. Its paper world is handmade by one person. When I saw a video of the developer crafting every single thing out of paper and then arranging lighting around it, I was just blown away by the quality of this complicated art form and the hard work that went into every single little thing. I'll leave a link for you in the description box below so you can watch it too. You can complete Papetura in about two hours. This game is visually stunning, it plays great, tells a good story, and it will become dear to your heart very, very quickly. Greek Memories of Asia is also something I picked up during one of the Steam festivals. Initially, I thought that controlling three characters simultaneously on screen and not having one character change into different people like in Trine would be too much pain, but it actually wasn't at all. The game has a lovely art style, it plays great, and it uses a rather rare party of three siblings. It's heartwarming to see them reunited, to see them care for one another, to see the big brother trying to protect everyone. I think Greek uses a rare setting too, much like Tyranny, in Greek, the enemy invasion has already happened, the homeland has already been lost, and the only thing you can do is run from the impending apocalypse. It's ultimately a tragic story, but there's also a lot of hope in it. With Greek, I felt the drawbacks of playing video games on launch. There were some rough patches, I believe I encountered a little bug, and moving all three characters at once was sometimes a little difficult, so I had to adjust them one by one. It didn't bother me at all, to be honest. After I've already completed the game, the devs not only fixed everything that wasn't working quite right, but also added new content, improved movement synchronicity and whatnot, so I assume now Greek is perfect. Great little gem. Amanita design games are not really something I enjoy or even understand, and yet every time I find myself inexplicably drawn to them. Happy Game was something I was actually excited about, and I really liked the demo I played in one of the Steam festivals. Honestly, I feel like I have finally found an Amanita game that actually clicks with me. Weird, huh? Probably tells more about me than about the title, but Happy Game is one of my top games of this year. It is disturbing, it is absurd, and it is hilarious. I never laughed so hard in the whole of Chuchol as I did in a single episode of Happy Game. Be careful with this game, though. It's very visually intense, so if you have any history of seizures or any discomfort caused by flickering lights, you'd probably want to skip this one. Backbone was something that I really liked, but it seemed to me no one else did. It was really funny in a way. The demo of Backbone included a couple of puzzles, so people really expected it to be a point-and-click puzzle adventure, but Somehow those puzzles from the first hour of the game ended up to be the only ones in the whole game, and the title progressed like a narrative adventure, so this made many people upset. The game also doesn't have a definitive ending, more like an open one, and I of all people would have hated that, because that's something I'm never happy about, but weirdly enough, I just didn't care, for some reason. I don't know, Backbone is a mood. It's a post-noir existential despair that I crave. 
It reminds me of Disco Elysium and its existential despair. It makes me reflect on things. The story is great. It starts as a typical detective case that you need to crack. You chase the culprit, you spy and bribe, gather evidence, try to have everyone's attention. But then the focus shifts in a really unexpected way and leaves you kind of shocked. I like that. I like when stories do not play out as I predict. I like being surprised by the narrative. And the game looks absolutely incredible. The lighting is gorgeous. There were a couple of scenes that just took my breath away. All in all, I think if you don't expect it to be a puzzle game and if you're okay with things having more of an open ending with some sequel potential, you will probably like it. I enjoyed it for the reasons I usually don't enjoy many other games for. When I started playing Lost and Random, I was blown away by its aesthetics, its story and its voice acting. It feels like you're in a fairy tale. However, I felt like the battles were too lengthy at the start of the game. Your dice can only give you one, two or three. You have like five different cars that you endlessly rotate trying to get through the waves of enemies that just keep coming. This was really exhausting and I just dropped the game for like a month or so. But I couldn't forget about it. Couldn't move on because everything else was so good. So I came back to give it another chance and I'm glad I did. Lost in Random is a dark fairy tale with incredibly entertaining card battles. They are actually fun. I liked how relatable the protagonist was, the unlikely hero. It reminded me a lot of Despero from The Tale of Despero by Kate de Camilla. You're a hero who is trying to save the world not because you are the chosen one, not because you are fearless and it's your destiny, but because there is nobody else to do it. You are scared and alone, you feel so small and insignificant in the face of the evil you're up against, but there is simply no one else. I have to save her. There is no one but me to do it. It seems to be that way with most things. No one to do the really disagreeable jobs except oneself. The only thing I knew about Ace Attorney was the objection memes. I don't know how I got the idea to play this game. The premise didn't really sound all that interesting to me, but I absolutely could not stop once I started. I just couldn't stop. I was so deeply in it, the hours just flew by and it's 4am, I look like a mess, but I am determined to see this case come to its conclusion. Ace Attorney made me care about the main cast of characters as if they were my close friends. This game reminded me of simpler but insanely engaging stories that are not in any way spoiled by the fact that you know who the killer or the thief is from a mile away. Ace Attorney chapters are not in any way made worse by knowing how they end. It's the journey that counts. It is the distilled comfort of good always defeating evil, of friendship always prevailing that I sometimes desire so much. I am impressed by how each case is constructed from the narrative point of view, how personal dramas are mixed with the detective parts and sprinkled with twists and turns. You just never get tired of it. I think I still have one or two chapters left from Trials and Tribulations that I saved for myself to enjoy during the holidays and also because I just don't want these games to end. I also have to appreciate how many puns the English localization pulls out from god knows where, it's incredible. The Japanese original is also hilarious in many ways. There is wordplay on top of wordplay. I would love it if I could switch languages between Japanese and English, much like you can switch languages on the fly in Disco Elysium. I would even be happy if I could do it somewhere from the options menu, but no, the language is tied to the save file. Well, one more reason to replay Ace Attorney sometime in the future. The fifth Pantheon category is named after the final Pantheon in Hollow Knight's DLC Got Home. I have been calling my most favorite games by this name for years now. I would play a game, love it and say, oh, this is the fifth Pantheon. So these are the games I enjoyed the most this year, my best gaming experiences of 2021. Oh, playing Resident Evil Village is my personal achievement this year. You see, I don't play first-person games. At all. Because I can't. When I was a little kid, I sustained a psychological trauma playing first-person games, and now, 20 years later, I still can't play them. Couldn't play Superliminal, although I really wanted to because it was terrifying for me and it's a puzzle game. I'm getting better little by little. A couple of years ago, I was able to stomach Borderlands 2 in co-op. It always goes easier with shooters for some reason. I didn't even dream I'd be able to play Village, so I was ready to watch someone's playthrough on YouTube like I usually do with this type of games. But I was just way too interested in it. 
it looked awesome and I thought, but maybe, maybe I can. I need to give it a try. So I bought it on release, ready to refund after an hour or so, but surprisingly I was able to push through. I streamed the whole thing because this way I was slightly more comfortable playing it and I did it. I completed it. And I'm really proud of myself. Maybe I will be able to play more first-person games in the future, who knows. Village is a great game. There is a lot of action, a lot of scary chase sequences that you'd expect from a Resident Evil game. I thought the location design and the village aesthetic were really impressive. And I have to appreciate the marketing campaign that made it seem that Lady Dimitrescu was the final boss, when in reality she's basically just a tutorial you get past her in a few hours. Each boss had its own theme and its own little personal storyline. I didn't really like the way the game poured the whole plot on you in the last couple of hours with a whole bunch of notes and you're very likely to miss one and thus miss some major revelation. That was weird. All in all, Village is awesome. Play it if you haven't already. It's a lot of fun. I never played the original Link's Awakening, only this one, and I played it twice. And I very, very rarely do that. Link's Awakening is a fantastic game. It's cute, it's clever, it's challenging, it teaches you new things in such a soft and subtle way you barely notice. I think my last point is kind of a trademark of Zelda games. I felt like a kid again while playing Link's Awakening, and it was one of the most pleasant experiences I've had all year. The only complaint I have is that the last two levels are considerably longer and much more difficult than the previous ones. The difficulty curve is really gentle, but in the last two dungeons it suddenly spikes really high. Otherwise, Link's Awakening is an awesome game would recommend to anyone. Oh, The Crown of Leaves, probably one of the most hidden gems on Steam. The second chapter was released this year, so I'm using it as an excuse to talk about it. The Crown of Leaves is a visual novel adventure game created by a duo of incredible Russian artists. The thing that just keeps me coming back to The Crown of Leaves is its absolutely mind-blowing world-building. Lindgren have been developing their world and expanding their setting for many years now, so in this visual novel you can see a thoughtfully built world that functions on its own. As someone who did a lot of studies on cultures, I was stunned by how the people of this world have their own myths, legends, established family traditions, charms of good luck that actually have stories explaining how this thing came to be a lucky charm historically. A million tiny little things that we culturally accumulate over centuries. I've never seen anyone create something this nuanced and then fearlessly translate it into a visual novel. It tells a story of a failed young jeweler that has to return to his homeland and live with his relatives while trying to complete his final work for an aristocrat. Of course, nothing goes according to plan and he winds up in the center of a mystery. I encourage you to play it. The Crown of Leaves does have English localization and the final chapter is already in development. Control is definitely among the best games I played this year. I felt like everything in this game was made so that the player would be most comfortable. The telekinesis works incredibly well, you don't have to aim every time, although you can. If you don't have an item nearby, Jesse will just yank a part of the floor or a chunk of the wall. Its audio design is impeccable, it always feels strong and powerful. The pacing of control is amazing, it accelerates too much at one point, but otherwise I don't have any qualms with it. I also like that in multi-stage fights the game saves you at certain checkpoints, so if you die you don't have to redo 10 minutes of fighting again. Overall, I just felt like the game cared about me and my comfort a lot, while still being challenging and scary, and it was a weird feeling, but I appreciated it. The story that Control tells appealed to me greatly. The game uses some incredible literary devices to elevate its narrative. Control looks gorgeous if you enable all RTX whistles, it's an incredible experience overall. I like the first DLC, The Foundation, however I didn't enjoy AWE all that much. I don't really like when there is an immortal boogeyman in the dark room who tries to kill me while I run around trying to screw in all the light bulbs, and it seemed to me that AWE relied too heavily on this sequence and repeated it too many times. I have a blog post on Control. I leave you a link below so you can read more about my impressions if you're interested. Well, 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 isn't it Inscription? I was very intrigued when I saw the demo, and I was completely blown away when I played it. I think Inscription's demo was among the best gaming experiences I've had this year. When the game came out, I started it immediately and, well, what can I say? The first act is its best part. It's so unique an experience that I don't think I've seen something quite like it. 
I am over card games, you know, I don't like deck building and stuff, but I have to say that Inscription has the most bizarre, the most flexible, and the most fascinating card mechanics I have ever seen in a card game. You can do the most insane combos, make the craziest cards, and the game would handle it perfectly. I expected it to somehow break when I started combining the incompatible, but it didn't, and it was awesome. I thought it would be my top game of the year, well, definitely the fifth pantheon. Unfortunately, beyond Act 1, there wasn't much that was really on the same level. In the second part, I picked the same deck with beasts and I had really bad time because now there was only one deck where both my creatures and my resources were mixed up, when before, at the start of my turn, I had the choice whether I want a resource or I want to draw from the deck. So now I was perpetually stuck either with a full hand of stupid squirrels with nothing to actually spend them on, or a full hand of creatures that I cannot play because I don't have the squirrels. And I had to just restart again and again and again until I could play at least something. So yeah, the middle part wasn't exactly inspiring for me, but I know that if you pick any other deck, you'll have much more luck. Act 3 is reminiscent of Act 1. Great gameplay, a little bit of horror here and there, but I felt this part of the game lasted for way too long and there weren't much events outside the playing field to break up the monotony. So yeah, Act 1 is perfect, Act 2 is meh, Act 3 is fine. There is also the whole meta thing with secret codes, true endings, editing game files, you know, the kind of stuff you'd expect from the creator of Pony Island, but I'm not into it and I kind of stay away from it. Overall, I'd say that Inscription is a good game, but I can't help but feel a little disappointed by the stark contrast of how it started versus how it progressed and eventually ended. This has to be the one best game I completed this year. I started Breath of the Wild last year, but finished it this summer. I remember being so lost after I finished it. I was just sitting there thinking, is that it? How can I play any other game when I've already played the best one? How can I ever play games again? And I had been wallowing in this melancholy for like two days straight before I recovered. I know that much has been said about Breath of the Wild over the years, and I'm not going to explain how it's great or how it's a game to make you love games again or anything along those lines. I'll just say that Breath of the Wild's open world spoiled me rotten, and now when I start the game that says I'm open world, I'm like, okay. In this game, for the first time in my life, I actually felt like I was indeed saving the world when I ventured deep into Hyrule Castle. It was scary, and it was uplifting, and it was an adventure exactly like in the books I read as a child. Breath of the Wild made me care about everything like I used to when I just started playing video games 20-something years ago and when every NPC's troubles were my troubles. Best game I played this year, and probably the best game I have played in my entire life. That's like 20 games we just went through. I'd say my gaming experience in 2021 was pretty good and I look forward to 2022. I've started playing Ruined King, I streamed Devil May Cry 5 and I've never played a DMC game before, so after DMC 5 I'll probably catch up on the previous installments. Oh, and I also got Metroid Dread as a New Year gift, so I'm pretty excited about that. I'd say that this year's Steam festivals were really something I looked forward to. I mentioned a handful of good games that I picked up solely because I played their demos during a festival. I think these events are a good way to highlight smaller game developers and debut titles and just give people a bunch of demos to try out. When a Steam festival starts, I usually dive in, go through several dozens of titles, pick 10, 12, 14 demos and just play them all. As a result, I end up with a couple of games I really look forward to. And I always make sure to pick something that I usually won't be interested in to rediscover genres that I deemed uninteresting years ago. I also try my best not to continue playing games that I don't really enjoy. When I was younger, I was adamant that you should finish every book and every game and every movie once you started it. I think it stems from my early childhood, where video games were hard to come by, and if you didn't like the game you had, well, you're out of luck, because there are no other alternatives, so you play and replay this only game that you have until some other game comes along. Luckily, now we have much easier access to games, and we have choice. Time is precious, so if I decide to spend some of it playing a video game, it better be one I really enjoy, or at least the one I'm in some way curious about. Please let me know in the comments what your best and worst gaming experiences were this year. 
Maybe there was a game that you really wanted to play but ended up not liking. Or on the contrary, the game you didn't expect anything out of turned out to be one of the best. It doesn't matter if the game was released this year or if it's the first installment of Ultima. I'm just interested in what you have played in 2021. I hope to do the same type of video in a year, if I'm still doing YouTube by that point. Don't forget to check the description for links to my blog posts about some of the games I mentioned in this video. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll see you in the next one. And a happy new year. Take care.